Welcome back, Box Breakers. This is Becky Ford. And I'm Ashley Insights. And today we have a special guest who's joining us. He is uh, someone that we see quite a bit in the gym, but he has many talents and strengths outside of the gym. Uh, so we're going to introduce Chase here in just a little bit, and we are going to be talking about coaching and how do you infuse coaching in your organization and your culture. First, uh, we, we're going to ask our question, what's on the rise for you this week? Ash, what's on the rise for you? Well, I think I, th- I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, but we're doing The Little Mermaid at work, um, like a big production of The Little Mermaid, and it's get- getting it's getting chaotic. Like to bo- I tried to get to the gym at noon today, and before that, I had to crank out a whole bunch of content for the program, and it just it feels like it was on the rise before, but now it's like really on the rise, <laughs> trying to get everything done. So, yeah, cramming for The Little Mermaid. It's going to be a lot of fun, but it's a lot. It's a lot of work all the marketing and stuff. And you might see it around, around town, around Indianapolis and, uh, on the news and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been fun. How about you, Becky? Uh, that's a big deal. (laughs) That's exciting. Uh, no fun, uh, mermaid stuff going on in my world. (laughs) However, I will say what's on the rise for me. I had a moment this week where I caught myself being very critical to myself in a workout that had handstand pushups. And in that moment, I caught myself being super critical. And then I remembered that four years ago, I couldn't even do one. And this week I did 60 in a workout by myself. And it was, it's those moments where you just have to remember our, it's, you always want more. Like four years ago, if I told myself someday, Becky, you're going to do 60 handstand pushups in a workout by yourself, I would have said, you're crazy. And then I did it this week. And even though I was still slow, I did it. So for me, uh, I was actually really proud that I changed my self-talk in that moment and could appreciate where how far I've come in four years. That's awesome. I'm proud of you. Oh, thanks, Ash. Uh, and I, I did mention uh, handstand push-ups is a great segue to our guest today, Chase Hitari, one of the best handstand push-uppers in our gym. So Chase, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I, and I appreciate the compliment. I don't have a, a, a ton of strengths in CrossFit, but handstand push-ups might be one of them. Uh, you definitely have more than that. Uh, your cardio, <laughs> your fitness. Um, so he's being he's being humble. Uh, but Chase, what's on the rise for you? And then we're going to have you uh, introduce yourself even more to folks here. Sure. So you know, I've traveled the past uh, two or three weeks. I've been in Colorado. I've been in Arizona. And uh, part of my personality is I'm I'm a lot of uh, work and no play at times. I will buy anything in the world for my kids, but I won't spend money on myself. So the past two trips have just been. Uh, me and friends and, uh, and hanging out. So it's, it's been awesome. It it really has the past two or three weeks. Good for you. What inspired you to do some stuff for yourself? Uh, you know, I I'm externally motivated in that way. So I had friends that really pushed me along. It was my 40th birthday this last weekend. And, um, uh, to be honest, they were kind of ribbing me for not planning something and doing something. And so, uh, yeah, we went to Arizona and played some golf and, and, and hung out. So those types of things, it's nice to have friends around that, that, that push you into those things that aren't necessarily, uh, in your comfort zone, so to speak. That is awesome. Happy birthday, by the way. Appreciate it. Most Appreciate people it. have no idea that you're 40. <laughs> way too fittest, kind. Way too kind. It is 40 year old. I know. Um, well, Chase, tell our listeners a little bit more about who you are. What do you do besides tons of handstand pushups and golf for fun? Um, tell us a little bit more about you. Sure. Well, uh, I'm a a self-professed leadership nerd. I love anything about leadership and and in that way, that that way, coaching. Um, I started off as a a teacher and then moved into some assistant principal roles, high school and middle school. I've been a a middle school principal, a high school principal. Currently, I'm the chief academic officer uh, in Franklin Township. And so basically, I'm in charge of all grades 7 through 12 curriculum instruction uh, principles and, and all those fun things. And so I get to meet with them, talk leadership, talk organizational culture. And uh, I was lucky enough to get my Ph.D. a couple of years ago, actually, right before the pandemic started. I, I actually defended my dissertation the day Indiana State shut down. I got really lucky. So I was one of the last in-person um, defenses. But my dissertation was on personality and organizational culture. And um, I got really interested in that side of it because we've all had bosses that change the way work feels for us. And I got really interested in, in what part of that is the boss's piece of that. How much do they need to know about how they impact the organization? And so here I am today talking to uh, two people that love talking about the same things I do and, and uh, I'm going to enjoy the chat. I love that. And, and Chase, uh, I know we briefly were 
<laughs> talking in the corner of the gym. And that's how all of this got sparked. And right now the organization I'm in, a big hot topic is how, like you just said, managers, the role that managers and leaders play in the engagement of employees, um, how, how well employees are set up to succeed. And even like you just said, the personality differences we have to flex to, um, that's something our organization is constantly trying to, to coach towards and infuse yeah. what is the, what, what are those tips for a great coach, um, to lean into giving your employees and your team members what they need. So I'm super excited to learn from you today. <laughs> Awesome. We will, well, you know, you, we, you bring up a good point there. I'll just kind of segue in. Uh, there's a quote that says, if the leader sneezes, the building catches the cold or the organization catches a cold. And it's the same way in, in coaching. If, uh, you know, you started off on a positive note saying that I caught myself being negative about something that was going on in the gym and I went through it. And in, in a coaching situation or a leadership situ situation, that vulnerability, that ability to be humble about um what you're not great at opens up avenues for other people to do the same thing and and tackle those things. Um, because as I was telling my principals earlier, no, no matter what you do or how hard you work, you're only going to fit whatever you're doing, probably 67% of it, whether it's a job or whether it's a, a client that you're coaching, you're always going to be chasing that 33% always. And people handle it very differently when they see that 33%. Some see it as doom and gloom that I'm uh, an, an imposter. I've got imposter syndrome. I, I'm never going to quite get where they want me. I, I, I'm never going to reach perfection. And other people view it as a challenge. And so having people around you that can kind of urge you on and, and let you view it as a challenge and say, you know what, brick by brick, I think I can do this is, is extremely important. That mindset. I love it. Oh my gosh. So many directions we can dig in here. Uh, let's start. And I, I appreciate even just getting to hear you talk about uh, you, you coaching these principles. So tell us a little bit, when people hear the word coaching, I know oftentimes in my organization, people will say, oh, you need a business acumen coach. You need to learn more about this. You need to learn more about that. But when, when you use the word coaching, tell us what do you mean by that? And what are those different roles that people might play in your development? So we've got coaches, mentors, uh, maybe a therapist, that type of stuff. What, what is coaching and what are the different roles people might also get that confused with? Well, you mentioned a couple different roles there, and and I, I hate to pigeonhole any of them because if you ever go into coaching anybody, you're at some point going to fit all of those roles. You're going to be somebody's uh, quasi therapist and counselor and coach and and mentor. And I'm not telling anybody that's unlicensed to go give therapeutic advice, but you get what I'm saying. Somebody, if you really get into a good conversation with somebody, um, and so let me take it back a step. Coaching is going alongside somebody in their journey. That's the way that I look at it, and that's the way I describe it. Uh, to my principals that I, that I talk to. Their journey is their journey. I can't walk a day in their shoes. I may have been in that position, but it doesn't make my journey their journey. So as a coach, my job is to ask questions that, that challenge their thinking about where they are at. Not because they're doing it wrong, but because I, I want to open up kind of a reflective channel on what the possibilities are. Because that's a lot of time where we get stuck just in human nature. And when I talked about that 67%, 33%, where you're always chasing that 33%, is we get stuck in that the possibilities uh, aren't possible for us. We look at it and it's so big and it's so large. And social media teaches us and, 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 and TV teaches us that there's perfection out there. I'm here to tell you there's not perfection out there. And your possibilities are not somebody else's possibilities and you can do it. And it's, it's brick by brick. I keep using that, that analogy uh, over the past couple of weeks. I really have, because it really is, it's picking up that first brick and going, it's doing one handstand pushup, then it's doing two. And then it's having somebody in the gym, look at you and go, yeah, you, you need to do more than two. And then once you reach that next level, you're like, oh my gosh, I can. And then your possibilities grow. And that's what a coach is, is I, in a coaching session, I probably ask more questions than I give answers. In fact, I hope that I ask more questions than I give answers because really I want them to see the possibilities are out there in their journey, not in my journey. I love that headline you started with it. And I don't know if I'll say this exactly how you said it, but it's that partnership, um, working with that other person and believing that they have, they have their solution because their journey is different from yours. And, and I, so you already mentioned asking questions. Yep. And hopefully you ask more questions than maybe give advice. What are some of those other like core competencies or tips that you would have for managers or leaders on how to be a good coach? 
Yeah, I think the, the the tagline that I go by all the time, and I've done a couple of different uh, leadership conversations with groups on this, is we talk about the golden rule, and the golden rule is ingrained in us when we're kids: treat others as you want to be treated. That that sort of thing. But in leadership and in coaching, you can't do that. So if you take it from this standpoint, you say, coach others the way you want to be coached. You can't do that because again, it's not your journey. But we often do that. We slip into our world of the way we want things to happen. And then we forget that it's about the other person. And so you actually have to break the golden rule when you're, when you're coaching somebody. And so that's, that's the first tip that I give anybody. And then from there, it's about first digging into yourself, know thyself, who are you? What are your go-tos in the terms of the things that you like to do? What are the things that you aren't so strong at? And really dig into that piece, because if you can be reflective about those, again, you can have that kind of humble piece and that vulnerable piece walking into a coaching session where you know who you are, you know where your strengths lie, where your weaknesses lie, and you can be open about those. And it helps with the person. So break the golden rule, know thyself. And then number three would be know your audience. That's when you really try to get to know the person that you're talking to and and where they where they they want to go and what their personality is and how you can frame the conversation so that feeds the strengths that they have and and allows them to really uh, take the steps forward in their journey. I love that, Chase. I want to just throw in a total random anecdote on the get uh, know thyself because I absolutely agree with you, like 100% knowing yourself and working through those parts of you is integral to growing. Um, my, I had a counseling appointment yesterday and my counselor was talking me through family systems therapy, which I'd heard, I've heard about, but I've never, she's never talked to me through. And it's basically understanding the different parts of yourself and what they need and what they want and why they exist. And so she said she was going to send me some, uh, information afterwards by email. And she sent me an email afterwards with the subject line, getting to know your parts. And I was like, I feel uncomfortable with this. <laughs> I know what you meant, but can we use some different phrasing? <laughs> so anyway, that's just a total side note, but I love, yeah, I love those, those three steps. Thanks. Yeah, for and even, those. even further along that is when you, when you're talking about know thyself, it's also about taking care of yourself and filling your own bucket, because if we don't do that, we're going to get a lot of research and a lot of personality research shows that we have psychological needs that are unique to us. And if we don't get those met positively, we will get them met negatively somewhere else in another route. And so I learned quickly that I love action. I'm a logic and action guy. I want to take in the facts and then I want to go on it right away. And in in my line of work, that doesn't that doesn't work because change is a process that takes time. And I had to figure that out pretty quickly. Well, Weirdly enough, the thing that gives me the action, the incidents that I need to, to feed that is CrossFit. It's a time on it's a time domain. There's a clock on the wall. There's people around. There's action going on. And it's something different every day. You don't know what it is. And so that was a way that I filled my own bucket so that when I came to work, um, I wasn't doing that because the truth is, and, and you guys talked about personality in episode one, there's there's you know, there's personality, all these personality instruments out there. Are you a one, a two, a three? Are you a, you know, ENFJ or whatever else is from, from my standpoint and and the things that I've read, we can be any of those personalities. We can be an extrovert. We can be an introvert. We can be, we can deal in feelings. We can deal in action, but we only have so much gas in each one of those tanks, so to speak. And we can only access those gas tanks when we are in an okay place overall. So if I'm in a good place and I'm talking with you guys and I'm not a feelings guy, I struggle with it, but I can talk feelings. The amount of times that that I can do that before I just get mentally exhausted and I can't do it anymore and I need to refill my tank is fairly short. And so I realize that about myself. So I have to make sure that I fill my own buckets. I make sure my gas tanks are full so that I can access those other personalities. So I, I don't want anybody in terms of personality to ever think about this is who I am and I'm in this box and don't mess with me because if you start talking feelings, I'm going to lose my mind. That's not it. It is understanding myself so that I can fill that tank, fill that my bucket and make sure that I can access those things and be the best coach, the best friend, the best partner that I can possibly be. I have so many questions <laughs> I want to ask now based off everything you've said, Chase. Um, first, I, a cool, I just love this, treat others the way they need to be treated. Yes. So changing up that golden rule. You've talked about personality types. And I also love hearing you when you talk about making sure you fill your bucket so that you can 
t- pull on that energy that might not come as natural. Uh, that also leans into this whole like coaching the whole person and not just the one problem necessarily because there could be a different root cause. So, okay, let me rewind because I have lots of questions based off all this genius stuff you're saying. What, when it comes to personality tools and assessments, and I know you listened to our our first episode on that, what the most basic like personality profile or instrument, what do you suggest to most people that you coach or manage who are people managers for them to get to know the personality types of their team members? Well, this will drive some people nuts, but I'm going to say all of them. And uh, I I know it's a lot about focusing on one thing. But what I tell people is every time that you read something that that may hold the mirror up to yourself or have even better, have somebody else hold up the mirror to you so that you get that unfiltered look about who you are and how you may respond to things. And so anytime that you can read anything right now, Enneagram is something that I, I really love right now. Um, and there's a lot of Instagram pages out there and you don't know who's behind the Instagram page. It could be Joe Blow that knows nothing about personality, but each one of those little slides gives me an opportunity to read and reflect on who I am and how I respond to situations. And it also gives me opportunity to slide through those and see other people that I may interact with. And so I say, anytime that you get an opportunity to get feedback about yourself through a personality instrument, through a, a, a trusted confidant, take it. And, and take it all in, not as fact, but as, as the filter through who am I and do I do that sometimes? And how could I be better at that? And, and again, back to what I said before, how can I make sure that I'm in an okay place so that I can do that? Because if I am stressed to the max and I'm not having a good day, I'm not going to be able to access any other personality that's not strong for me. And so, yeah, my answer is all of them. Anytime you can get feedback, take it and don't be afraid and don't feel lesser than don't feel like somebody is talking down to you because there there's no such thing as as bad personality they are all characteristics of who we are and we're all very very different and i'll say one one piece on that that i that i thought about yesterday i was thinking about this conversation when you're trying to talk about somebody else's personality not your own because reflecting on ourselves we can we can filter that through and, and most of us can do a pretty good job When we're talking about somebody else, you have to understand how big your blind spots are to other people. Every once in a while on Facebook, there'll be a little picture that pops up and it's a paragraph and it's got missing letters in it. And it says, if you can read this, you're a genius. You've seen those? I see everybody. uh, Yes, you've seen those. (laughs) So your brain automatically fills in those gaps because you've experienced those things so many times. You've seen those words thousands and thousands of times. Think about how many interactions you've had with other people that are different than you thousands and thousands of times. Our brain does the same thing in the gaps of the things that we don't know about the people we're talking to. So if I'm meeting somebody for the first time, I'm hearing what they're saying. I'm seeing their facial expressions, maybe what clothes they're wearing. My mind is filling in gaps to make sense of their personality in that moment. We need to be very cognizant of that because those aren't facts. That is the the, the lens of your past they're they're running through and so you have to be very careful there when you're talking about personality it's a it's a great tool it's not fact it's not exact but it gives us a good ability to reflect but when we're talking about other people understand that you have huge blind spots and you are constantly filling in the gaps on who somebody else is based on your thoughts um, because you don't have that information in that moment actually just heard the other day uh in a course they said they asked us how long does it take for you to get your first impression and I've heard, I've heard like different numbers and the current number that they shared, and this was just like a month ago, was three seconds. Mm-hmm. Three seconds for that first impression. It, it, just like what you said, Chase, because of um, just what you're seeing, your brain is filtering through already an impression of this person, whether it's true or not. Um, so yeah, in- interesting how the mind works. Yeah. Um, and I, I like that you say any, any and all of these personality tests help. And one of the things things I've noticed, personality test, no matter which one you use, it gives you a common language that's safe to talk about who you are, your blind spots, how you prefer to communicate, all of that stuff. Um, So it gives us a safe language that's common that we can speak. Uh, And it also, for some people, they might not know how to articulate how they feel about things, but it, it might give them a label or description that helps them be like, oh yeah, I, that's me. Okay. I, that totally makes sense. I couldn't have written it any better. I love that you mentioned Instagram. I feel like I follow a whole bunch of personality, like hashtags and personality uh, type accounts and different things. And 
I some of it is serious and some of it's ridiculous. Like some of it's like, you know, which friend's character is your personality type and that kind of thing. But I like seeing both because it does remind me that no matter what, there are good and bad parts of everyone's personality. Like it's not one personality is not better than another, like you said. And I love seeing both sides of it. It also I can usually tell the person person in my life that I'm struggling with by which personality type I like swipe to the first because I can be like oh I'm seeing this thing about Enneagram numbers and I like swipe to six and I read that one first and I'm like oh some I'm having trouble with some six in my life (laughs) or whatever you know whatever number it is that week Um, and that kind of gives me some insight into yeah what I'm dealing with and what I'm thinking through. Yeah. No, they're fun to read. And, and the other piece of that for from the coaching perspective is once you understand somebody else's personality style um, and, and, and a, it, it improves your communication with them, because we all speak the same language, at least the most of us do. Right. We're a melting pot. But for the most part, we're speaking English, especially when we're coaching folks. And so we speak the same language. But when you're talking about how we filter the world, we hear differently. We're, we're, we could hear the same conversation. We could re- respond to it two completely different ways. And so you have to think about it as kind of a walkie-talkie radio that you're changing the channels on. If you're not on the same channel as somebody else, you could be talking till you were blue in the face and they don't hear you. It's only until you switch that channel that you get in there and they can hear what you're saying. And the thing about coaching and leadership is it is your responsibility to switch that channel for yourself. They should not have to shift to you. You are the chameleon. You have to figure out how to adapt your leadership style to the person that you're that you're talking to. And that's that's extremely in, in, important. And any and all information is good information. And and sometimes you, I think you guys are exact, exactly right in terms of that really opens up. It, it gives it a a low level entry into a conversation with somebody. If you know, they say, well, I'm an Enneagram, too. And, and then so you see something on Instagram and you forward it to him, say, hey, is that you know, what do you think about this? Does this describe you? such an easy and a way and they can respond back you know I think the first two things but not really the third things and you just got information um, we did the Myers Briggs yesterday in our leadership Academy here in Franklin Township and you know seeing everybody's Myers Briggs is incredibly interesting to be able to see and you know the person that I one of the people that I directly supervise is the exact opposite Myers Briggs as me we are letter by letter exact opposite. And so I have to filter that each time that we have a conversation, each time I'm starting to feel frustrated by a conversation, I'm sure she gets very frustrated by me, but I, I took, I take it internally and say, okay, what am I doing in this situation that is preventing us from communicating effectively? And yeah, personality really can do that for you. It's, it's a cool moment when you realize you're working closely with someone who's complete opposite from you. And I can think of, there's a gentleman named Kevin and I had to work really close with him in R and D. He was a scientist I am like extrovert and get stuff done, details, whatever, you know, we'll p- someone else pay attention to the details. And uh, Kevin was complete opposite personality. And at first it was a huge struggle. And just to your point, taking the time to get to know, and I, I didn't share Instagram posts with him. I don't think he has Instagram. He's retired now, <laughs> but uh, maybe he's gotten it since. Uh, but just having those conversations, we got lunch. And we would we just talk to each other about stuff outside of work and get to know each other. And we got to go on some work trips. And by the end, I worked with him for about two years. And before he retired, um, he was one of the people that I appreciated and grew a friendship with. Um, and I learned so much through that working relationship because we were so different. And we did have tension at first, um, but we we managed to truly care enough to get to know each other and learn how to leverage our differences in the workplace. And so I don't know if you and this this uh, person you manage have, you know, if you've had an ex- similar experience with that opposite personality, what feels like a negative turning into a huge positive you know, I, I will add something. You talked about sitting down for lunch and, and having those conversations that aren't coaching conversations. They're just getting to know somebody. Those those things and building trust with somebody is extremely important. Um, I'll, I'll brag on your husband a little bit and the question of the day at the gym. It's such a, a when I first walked into that's not my personality. Felt really, really hokey. Well, I brought it into my team meetings here. Why? Because it starts a conversation that you can start to get insight into what's important to somebody. The question of the day today was, would you rather go back in time and and visit your ancestors or would you rather go into the future 
and see your descendants. And it, but you know, you had people talking about um, their grandmother that they never got to meet. And so you see the, the meaning of family to this person. You got somebody that's a history buff that just wants to go back and see how things were. Um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, my last name's Finnish. Did I have a family that came through Ellis Island? Like, how does all of that work? And so you get to really get insight into people just from those simple conversations. And if you've got the personality, knowledge, any instrument, and then you have those types of conversations, you can really start to navigate the waters of getting to know somebody um, and building that trust with them. Oh my gosh. We are going to make Tristan's day by telling him you have implemented the question of the day. And you're exactly right. Like you get to know people, people make connections. Uh, it's a, it's a fun glimpse into uh, more beyond just the workplace. Um, so there's a great tip. Any managers out there, team meetings, question of the day, Chase just shared a great one. They can be completely random. You could go Google questions. The big thing is you got to make sure they're questions you can answer concisely. It's not going to take people like two paragraphs to answer it because most, most of us don't have that much time. <laughs> uh, okay. We've talked a lot about flexing that coaching for personality types, the benefit to any personality instruments, just go learn about people. There's probably some benefits in also knowing what not to do. <laughs> so from a coaching perspective, what are some common pitfalls or mistakes that you see coaches make, uh, that can hurt or hinder their ability to, um, to build up that team? Attempting to have all the answers. You, you are not going to have the answers and trying to, to do that is only going to stunt somebody's growth. Uh, even if you have the answer, giving somebody the answer doesn't give the, the, the ability to, again, take that in for themselves, make it a part of, of their own journey. And th that's, that's a huge piece of, of the whole thing. One of the things that I, I really like to do to make sure that I'm not just sitting there talking, giving the answers is doing some sort of reflective ex uh, exercise that's, that's given to me prior to our meeting. So I've got an idea of, of, of where this person's at. And, and if you write a really good reflective question, and again, Google's a great tool. I don't know why people are afraid to say Google it, but if you're looking for reflective questions to guide a coaching conversation, don't be afraid to pull it up and, and send it to that person in a, in a Google form so you can get it right back and then you can read that and then you can shape further reflective questions around the things that you see in, in those responses. Um, and really, I would say having the answer all the time is, is, is an epidemic in all of leadership because, uh, again, we're held to the standard with social media and society that it's supposed to be perfect and I'm supposed to know everything all the time. I, I'm not. There, there's no way. And me attempting to tell you that I know exactly what I'm doing is stunting my own growth. Um, and there's always somebody around the corner that knows more than me or that I, even if they don't know more than me, I can learn something from them if I just shut my mouth and listen. And that's what a lot of coaching becomes about. And, you know, when you switch over from that, I'm not talking, give the answers I'm listening is you got to think about how good of a listener are you really? Are you really listening to what they're saying? Are you looking at the little the little cues that they're giving off? Because they're not going to explicitly tell you what they're thinking. You're going to have to pick up those little pieces of what's in there, those insecurities, those I'm not sure, the, all of those things. And then you're going to have to circle them back around and ask another question that puts that right back in there. So be careful not to have all the answers and make sure that you're really listening. And the listening part, I'm still working on. It is so hard for me. And as an example, I'm really bad with names. It, I, I can look at somebody and meet them and think to myself, Chase, you're going to remember this person's name. And I'm thinking, thinking, and the minute they start talking, my mind goes, blah, 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 blah. And then I'm like, crap, I already forgot their name. And so, you know, that happens I'm not to a lot of people. Of you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's not just me. Um, you know, make sure that you're really listening because you shouldn't already be thinking about your next thing that you're going to say as that person's talking because you really aren't listening. Take a pause digest what they said, and then start to gear the conversation where you want to go. That presence is definitely so important. You can tell when someone's think, thinking about other things and not really listening very well. Uh, I'm just over here, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, man, his daughters, I can only imagine uh, they're getting coached at home. Uh, I don't know if they if they consider themselves fortunate to have such a pro coach of a dad, or if they're like, dad, stop, stop processing or facilitating me as I think through this. <laughs> you know, honestly, I, I don't, I don't bring it up too much, but I will tell you as a parent, my two girls are so different that I, I really do have to frame what I say to them differently yeah. um, in terms of, am I proud of them or am I proud of their work? Um, because I have one that is, knows the grindstone, wants to put in the work all the time. So I make sure um, like last night, 
it's on the rise for me. She scored 17 points in her basketball game. They won Woo-hoo. by two. She did a great job. And and I told her when she came off the court, I'm happy for you because of all the work that you've put in. And that was a way to shift it from, you know, the work she loves putting in the work and she deserves to, to have success because of all of that. My other daughter, she's much more feelings based and she wants me just to say, I'm proud of you. You're you're you were an unbelievable teammate today. You absolutely cheered for every person. And she's a great athlete in her own right, but she processes everything through the emotions of that she's a good person and that she's she takes care of everybody else. And so it's very different. So as a dad, I I do try to shift that. I'm not perfect all the time, but the way that we talk to our kids is is almost the same thing as what we do in coaching, is we really have to think about how we're portraying things and that um, you know, our kids are very different. And they, they perceive the world in a different way and we've got to meet them where they're at. That's beautiful. And that's a good reminder that we talk about coaching and we've talked a lot about the workplace. All of this, all of this applies to outside of work. This applies with your significant other, your friends, your kids, all of that. Um, so really good example there with your two daughters. Uh, want to, want to, ask one final big question before we start to, to pare down here to our closing. How do you create a powerful coaching culture in an organization? And clearly you've mentioned and referenced multiple times talking about coaching with the principals, the people that you manage. So how do you get that culture of coaching? It's, it's got to be risk-free in some way, because if you really want to have a good conversation with somebody, they have to be vulnerable. And that's the hard thing in organizations and, and, and a barrier that we have. It's not immovable, but a barrier we have is oftentimes the person doing the coaching is also our evaluator. And we have to have these evaluations. HR, you know, you've got HR things. And in, in education, it's actually state mandated that every person has this evaluation that brings in these metrics or whatever else it is. So it becomes a, a tricky piece, but you really have to let people know that it is not, this is not an evaluative process. This is, this is about growth and, and, and showing them within your organization, you can move up within your organization um, by doing the things that you need to do to, to grow. I, I tell this story all the time. Alan Mulally was the CEO of Ford when Ford was, uh, he took over Ford when Ford was going downhill, when all the auto companies were getting bailouts billions of dollars in the hole. And he, he's going to these meetings with all of his folks and and he's got this green, yellow, red system. So for like production and for whatever, they've each got a color and the, and the leaders of those departments are supposed to color code it before the meeting and then they're talked through it. So he goes through a couple of meetings where they're all green and he's, he's looking around. And so finally the third weekend, he's, he's sitting there and somebody turns over a red and he stands up and he applauds because it was the first person willing to be honest that something wasn't going well. And in coaching and in taking coaching in the same way, you have to be willing to be vulnerable. And when it's attached to compensation, when it's attached to evaluation, that becomes very difficult. I'll tell you what I've, I've done here with, with in some in the organization is we have, we have hired folks that are non-evaluative that do the coaching. And so they may teach a class and be in that department, but they also coach those folks in their department and they have nothing to do with, with evaluations becomes much more risk-free because that person can open up without fear of retribution in any particular way or fear that it's going to go in their permanent perm file. But, you know, if it's not risk-free, coaching is going to be pretty darn hard because you have to be vulnerable. Both parties have to be vulnerable to really get where you want to go. Yeah, that's awesome. I absolutely agree. And I feel like that piece of both parties having to be vulnerable, like the coach having to be vulnerable and open to everything that's coming at them and being willing to share their own experiences is a huge part of it too. Because I've been coached by some people that I'm like, this is a one way street. That's not, it's not as helpful as it could be to me because I'm not hearing vulnerably from you as well. So I love that. Chase, it sounds like we're going to need to have you back to uh, dive into some specific topics because I have a feeling this was just like, barely scratching the surface of the things you could share with us. And I am super stoked for future episodes with you. You can be thinking about what you want to talk about next because we'll come back to it. (laughs) I I love it. Anytime. I love conversations like this. I learn something every single time that I'm a part of something like this. So I appreciate you having me. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. It's been really fun. We're going to wrap it up here and we'll have Chase back again. Thanks so much, Chase, for your time. Have a great day, guys.